Is that everybody? It's ready? Perfect. I think that is everybody seated. Um, good evening, everybody. Today's meeting is open to the public and... You can't hear me? No. I'll shout just for you. <laughs> Alright, so today's meeting is open to the public. And a warm welcome to all of you in attendance. My name is Councillor Habi, Malachi Habi. I'm the Deputy Chair um, of this local area committee. Um, I'm chairing today for specific reasons. Anyways, before I ask the other councillors to introduce themselves, I, we were going to hand over to Democratic Services to do housing arrangements, but I'll read that out to you. <coughs> So it starts off with thanks, Chair, so I'll thank myself. Please can I request that mobile telephones and other such equipment are switched to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test plan for today. If there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the council staff present. The assembly point is... Council staff, where is the assembly point? Front car park. Front car park. Wicked. The toilet facilities are situated over there to the left of the kitchen. So the meeting today is open to the public and will be streamed live and for subsequent broadcast via the council website. So if you enjoy this meeting, you can watch it back unlimited amount of times. You should be aware that the council is a data controller under the Data Protection Act. Data collected during this webcast will be retained in accordance with the council's published policy. By entering the meeting room, which you're all sat in right now, you are consenting to be filmed and to the possible use of those images and sound recordings for webcasting. We also have hearing loops available. Does everybody understand that? Thumbs up? Brilliant. So, can I ask that members and officers around the table to introduce themselves? We'll start with Councillor... Hello, it's uh, Bernard Little, Walkley Councillor. Good evening, I'm Christine Gilligan and I'm a councillor <coughs> in Hillsborough. Good evening, my name's Tom Hunt, I'm a councillor for Walkley. I'm Ben Curran, also a councillor for Walkley. I'm councillor Ruth Mothrow, City Wars. Councillor Angela Rodenzio, Broomhill and Sharon Vale. Hi, I'm Adil Zaman, I'm the Central Act Manager. Jay Bell, Democratic Services Officer. Douglas Johnson, City Ward Councillor. Henry Nottage, Hillsborough Ward Councillor. That's Councillor Brian Holmshaw, Broomhill and Sharon Vale. Brilliant. Brilliant. Somebody got theirs left on. Nope. Brilliant. Um, so, just going to quickly discuss today's format. And it will be as follows. First, we will deal with... Of course you can. Um, sorry, I just want to ask, because we, we have democratically appointed a, a chair who's here, and normally a deputy chair would step in when the chair is unavailable, and he's literally there. So you said there's reasons, and I accept they may not be appropriate to share in a public forum. No. But we've... Okay, sorry, I'll uh, say that again. I was just saying, so... This committee and ratified at full council did appoint a chair who is here, and normally a deputy chair would step in when the chair is unable to, which isn't the case because he's there. Um, and I just would, would just like to know, uh, maybe not appropriate to say here, what those reasons are, because I think it's just part of the democratic process. If things are going to change, then people should be notified. That is a very valid question. Thank you for raising that, Councillor Curran. The reasons we can't state is personal. However, just to let you know, as a chair and deputy chair, which is available on the website, we get paid. So why not just use both of us to take the responsibility rather than just one person sitting there and getting paid for nothing? <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Curran. Wicked. So, um, I, have you got anything else to add? No. Brilliant. Wicked. Thank you for that. Anyway, so back to the... Schedule program. In today's format will be as follows. First, we'll deal with some quick formal business of apologies and declarations. We will then have a presentation and video from Sheffield Youth Cabinet. Two lovely ladies sat over there. Um, we will then move to the item of the Central Local Area Committee proposed spending. The area manager will firstly give a presentation. 
There will then be a discussion, debate, and members of the committee will be asked to agree the recommendations of the report. And then we will break out into group for our interactive, interactive session, which is for you guys, which is the purpose of ALAC, so you guys can make decisions with us. So we'll be spending longer times in breakout spaces where you guys have a lot more decision-making capabilities. So in future, anything that arises, you will be just as consulted as you are today. When we return, we will have public questions petitions from members of the public. However, you may wish to also ask your question of members during the breakout sessions. We, will finally, we finally would like to get some feedback from those in attendance at today's meeting and then we will finish with dealing with the minutes of the previous meeting. What that means, and it's very important, is it's a very, very good time for everybody in attendance to scrutinize how this meeting went, how we can improve, what you didn't like, and then we'll improve in the next one. So you guys can prevent anything happening where you don't like, and then you'll spend three hours sat in a room, and then, yeah. So you tell us off, because you guys elected us. Feel free, that's a very crucial 10 minutes to 15 minutes in the end, and it's open to you guys. Brilliant. So... I think we're moving on to the exclusion of the pub. Oh, well, actually, no. Apologies for absence, which Jay will... Chair, I've received an apology for absence from Councillor George Linders Hammond. Perfect. So it's just Councillor George. Martin is on his way. Um, the buses are actually taking along, which is something we are currently fighting against. Um, brilliant. So, declarations of interest. Do any members wish to declare an interest in any of the items of business on the agenda? Nope. Brilliant. In that case, our two lovely ladies, Emma and Sarah, who looked after me when I was very young at Sheffield Futures, and are here to present. Um, I'll hand it over to you guys to give a presentation and video. everyone, uh, lovely to meet you all. My name is Emma Hinchliffe and I am the Youth Voice and Influence Worker within Community Youth Services at Sheffield City Council. And this is Sarah. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello guys, I'm Sarah Stevens and I'm the Youth Voice and Influence Manager. And we're going to tell you a little bit about our service, what we do, and then Emma's going to tell you a little bit about the Youth Cabinet because Emma coordinates the Youth Cabinet. And then we're going to look at a film that we have made with our Young People's Police Group and Youth Cabinet around sexual violence and catcalling. So, firstly, I just want to issue, issue an apology on behalf of the members of the Youth Cabinet for this area. Unfortunately, they've had other prior commitments that they couldn't get out of um, to be with us tonight, so they send their apologies, but they've asked us to present on their behalf. Because you've got five elected youth, uh, youth councillors for this lack area. So... We're community youth services, we sit within the council, um, and we've basically got five strands. Is it okay? Not really. Oh, well done. Thank you. I'm going to... Let them click. Okay. So, within community youth services, there are five... Basically, there's five services. One is... Uh, universal youth services and they are all the youth clubs in the city so there's been a big investment in youth services and you will notice especially I think in the next 12 months more youth clubs in more areas the idea is that we will work in partnership with our partners to ensure that there is youth provision in every single ward within Sheffield so obviously that means the four wards in um, the central lack will all get youth provision if they currently don't get it um, or enhanced youth provision if they do. The next uh, strand is targeted services and that team looks after all the missing young people, it looks after it does sexual exploitation, child exploitation and prevention services, our CYT team. So if young people are getting into a bit of difficulty, they need a bit of one-to-one -one support, and that's like prevention services to try and stop that chaotic behaviour and find out what's going on. 
The next strand is the IAG service, which is information advice and guidance. So that's all our careers advisors. We have careers advisors in schools, um, out of school. We, if young people aren't in education, employment or training, then we've got workers who will go and find out why and support them to get into employment, education and training. We also have careers advisors who are specifically aimed at supporting SEND young people. So that's young people with special educational needs and disabilities. The next uh, service is around performance and quality. Um, and that's all our data, all our monitoring, all our financing and checking when we're hitting our targets, we're getting our outcomes. So that's that strand, it's all the back house kind of stuff. And then the last service is the Youth Voice and Influence, uh, which myself and Emma have come from tonight to tell you a little about, bit about what we do. So what does Youth Voice and Influence mean? Basically, it means that we listen to young people ground up. Um, it's not... It's about them telling us what they see is important in their lives and then what our job is to try and support them to influence some positive change and that might be at a local level, neighbourhood level, community level or it might be at a strategic level in the county council. So that could be young people going and talking to their peers around what they want to do in their local area, at the local park, right up to, um, well, this week, for instance, we've been going around alternative providers in Sheffield to find out what works, what's effective, uh, so that when we go and commission new um, alternative providers, we can make sure that we're getting it right. We support and empower those young people, so we're qualified and trained youth and community workers, so although a lot of the young people we work with are kind of task groups, they've got a purpose, they're doing things, we also make sure they have a bit of fun along the way as well and that they're learning new skills, new knowledge and that actually, you know, we're informal educators, that, that's um, what we're trained to do. So we're actually educating people without them knowing sometimes. Um, and then we make sure that we've got the structures and mechanisms in place to make sure that we can ensure that young people's voice is a golden thread through all our services. So Emma's going to talk to you about the Youth Cabinet in a little while, um, but we've got other such groups such as like SEND advisory groups, so they're young people with SEND who are real, really influencing our services, uh, what we produce, our websites, what they need to do, what are the gaps. Um, We've got a police advisory group, um, and we'll talk, Emma, when we go into the uh, film, we'll talk a little bit about that. But basically, that's a group of young people from all walks of life, all over Sheffield. And what they do is they meet quite regularly with us, with the police, um, and we talk about breaking down those communication uh, barriers, if there are any, what projects we can work on together, um, and it does go right up to the top in the police, and, and we all listen to. Um, just today, we've been talking to the Police and Crime Commissioner, because young people aren't happy when they go to report something at the moment. They've got to put their social media um, things in. Even though it's not mandatory, young people don't always see that as... You know, if there's a box there, they have to answer it. So we're trying to get that took off. And it's things like that. What, what we try and do is remove those barriers so that young people can engage. They're empowered to make that difference. And we make sure that they get the right audiences. So that's about who we are. I'm going to sit down and shut up. And I'm going to leave Emma to talk to you about the Youth Cabinet. So... Like the elected member structure, we've got a very similar structure for young people in the city. So what we've got is we've got elected members of UK Youth Parliament, which are very similar to the role of what our MPs do. So they work on national mandate. So we do every year a consultation of young people called Make Your Mark, which says, what do you think are the, are the biggest issues for young people in our city? Every city and town across the UK do that consultation. Those come together and decide what the national priority should be for young people for the year ahead. So this year it's become the cost of living crisis. So that's those young people and they've got that national mandate and that national remit and they also meet with um, 
government departments around specific areas, such as more recently, they've been looking at youth work and youth voice with the uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport in, in government, things like that. Um, and then we've also got elected youth councillors. So for each of the local area committee areas, we have five young people elected in to represent those local area committee areas. One is a member of UK Youth Parliament or a deputy member of UK Youth Parliament. The other four are elected to represent the four wards of the city. Now, the way that that election is run is it's an election once every two years. The young people have to write a manifesto, like elected members have to write a manifesto. In that manifesto, they have to say three issues that they will prioritise during their two-year term of office. And, and those manifestos are then printed, they go out to school and youth venues within those local area committee areas and young people get an opportunity to vote on who they want to be their elected members. Because we are bound by the national mandate of UK Youth Parliament, a lot of the young people tend to be 11 to 18, um, but what we do have in the Youth Cabinet is we have some special interest seats, so for young people that might not ordinarily get a voice through um, an elected role, so like young carers, young people that are looked after, um, those sorts of young people and those sorts of groups, they still get a voice within this structure and are able to influence those services and, and things at citywide level. So what they do is they meet monthly as a full cabinet, so everybody elected across the city come together once a month, and at that monthly meeting they will take part in relevant consultations or raise relevant issues that they want to work on, things like that. Um, and more recently they've raised lots of different things, including working with public health around vaping for young people. So this is the structure um, for the youth cabinet and you will see the different colour coded uh, because nationally we only get three elected members of UK Youth Parliament because of our um, youth population size. So in order to make it fair and to make sure we get cross representation across the city, we group the areas together based on the colour coded. So for this area we group South, South West and Central together um, to have a West member of UK Youth Parliament elected into that. And then at the bottom there you will see um, our special interest and link seats that any enable us to have a voice right through. So in terms of priorities, I've talked about um, the National Make Your Mark consultation um, and, and the priority around cost of living and health and wellbeing for young people. In terms of citywide, they've picked three campaigns. Votes at 16, we already got support um, quite a few years ago from the elected members around votes at 16, but it requires national change. So we're linking in with the British Youth Council at a national level to be able to um, lobby and to try and get that support around votes at 16 to be able to influence that change. In terms of the curriculum, young people have identified lots of kind of areas of their curriculum that they would like to see improved. Um, and what they did is they carried out a consultation um, with young people throughout Sheffield to say, what do you think are the most important things that you would like to change around your curriculum? And the things that were coming back was that the young people wanted the curriculum to be a bit more inclusive. Um, in particular, based on that, they've picked two areas that they're working forward with. Um, so the first one is around lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender community and the education that they get around that within schools, uh, in particular in relation to the sex and relationship education and how that links. And then the second one, um, they've identified that actually they would like some more education. Well, people that might have an additional disability, but more on the hidden disability side, so young people that might be suffering from mental illness or have autism or things like that that you can't necessarily see and that actually they want more education on how they can support their peers that might be in those situations. And then the last one, um, greater well-being. Um, so what we found is that across the city, um, the, the support from the schools around health and well-being, it varies. Some schools are really great and the students get access to counselling support services and they get lots of PSHE lessons around health and wellbeing and things like that. 
Other schools tend to only have a few drop-down days a year, so they'll cancel lessons for a full day and do it around a specific topic. And young people don't think it's fair that actually they don't all get similar access to services and similar support. Um, so they did a consultation around the support that actually students were getting in school and what they would like to see implemented. And what they have done as a result of that is they've linked with an organisation called COOF that provide counselling services online for young people 11 to 18 in our city and they are promoting that and encouraging their schools to take that on board. And then um, centrally the young people identified lots of um, various different issues um, that they kind of thought were, were important to tackle but the main one was around public transport and in particular safety on public transport for, for young people and that links into the work that we have been doing in terms of our film. So what we've done is we've worked with a group of young people through, it started off during the COVID pandemic where we met our young people's police advisory group in, in Western Park in the bandstand, um, all two metre distance apart and everything, and the young people were saying to us, actually, we've got a real issue in, in terms of catcalling, um, and the young women were saying, actually, we're being catcalled quite frequently. The young men were saying, actually, we're having to group round our, our young women and actually protect them because they're fearful of things like this happening to them and actually when it's happening they feel safer if they've got their male peers around them and they're doing lots of other things. We then embarked on the youth cabinet elections and a lot of the young people in their manifestos had issues around domestic violence and sexual harassment and, and catcalling that they thought were important to tackle um, and through both those groups that they decided that they wanted to develop a film. Um, so we developed a film called Be That Mate. We worked with a film company um, called My Pockets who came in, did a real session with the young people on picking what are the issues around catcalling. He started off with getting them to develop a piece of artwork around how it feels to be in that situation. And a lot of those images from the artwork have been used as part of the film. They, we, the group had a real in-depth discussion around actually how do we target the film and um, um, how do we broach this topic and in the end they decided that actually they wanted to aim the film at boys and young men and that, that's not saying that kind of all boys and young men can't call women and it's not dismissing that actually there's victims that aren't young women. We know that actually it does happen to other people that aren't just young women, but they thought in order to get the impact, especially in terms of aiming it at schools, that actually targeting boys and, and young men would create a greater impact and open up the opportunity to have those conversations because sometimes it's an issue that they don't often talk about. Um, so there were two main aims in terms of that film, and that was to educate their peers on the issue and also empower those young women and other young women and other victims so that they feel able to report the issue, tackle it if they want to kind of do some work around having a voice on that issue but mainly feeling empowered to be able to report that issue and, and to, move, to move forward with it and knowing actually when to report it and what actually it is in the first place. So I think we're going to show you the film. Um, we apologise now because sound isn't great tonight, but it do, does have audio description underneath it as well, um, because obviously we wanted to try and make it as accessible as possible. We're a bunch of teenagers, Lily, Munira. 
We're a bunch of teenagers. Lily. Monira. Lisa. Ellie. Roz. Eden. Lulu. Navara. Yelena. Neve. Zara. Samaya. And Lou. This film is for you, for men and boys like you. We love the way that you're funny, enthusiastic, protective, supportive and caring. We love all that. But let's face it, sometimes some of you are absolute idiots. Here's 10 things to understand. Number one. Everyone, everywhere, should be able to go where they want at any time of day, wearing what they want without being harassed. If you can, why can't we? Number two. In this room are 23 teenagers. When asked if they had been shouted at by men whilst walking home in school uniform, 21 of them said yes. Yes! yes. Some of us are 12. Pack it in. Number three. In this room, there are 23 teenagers. When asked if they had been groped or physically assaulted by men, 17 of them said yes. One 15-year-old has been cornered by two vans and had to jump over a wall to escape. Ask yourself, where is this all heading? Are you okay with it? Number four. Here are three different people you don't want to be. The perp. The egg it on. The do nothing. Now, if you're one of these men, pause, reflect, look in the mirror. If you're the perp, you need to know that sexual harassment that can include repetitive catcalling is illegal. If you are the egg it on, ease off and think about the damage you're doing. If you're the do nothing, speak up. Just move things along and get your mates leaves alone. There are all sorts of ways you can check the behaviour of your mates before it's too late. Number five. Here are some of the things that we're having to do that most fads don't. Plan our route, go in pairs, keep to well-lit areas, pretend to be on a call with our dads, text on arrival, keep our mouth shut so we don't get called bossy, change how we dress, keep our heads down, feel frightened and anxious when we go out, make ourselves invisible, make ourselves small, hide the light we have just to get by. Number six. That girl in the street is not just a face and a body. She is a person. Your mum has been her. Your girlfriend has been her. Your auntie. Your sister. The woman you chat to at work. The girl you sit next to at school. We are her. Number seven. This starts young. Boys will be boys. If he hits you, he likes you. Just ignore him. If you let it go when he is eight years old, then how will he know not to do it when he is 20? Tackle inappropriate behaviour towards girls early. Stopping the little things will stop the big things too. Number eight. We're not saying you can never make a joke. We're not saying you can never ask us out or pay us a compliment. We're saying pick up on the social cues. It's quite easy to tell if someone's not interested. If you make a mistake, just say sorry and move on. Jokes and compliments are only funny and kind when the person they're aimed at wants them. Number nine. This is a problem for boys and men. We can point you in the right direction, but in the end, you will have to actually wake up, take the step and do better. We need you to do something about it. You have to get involved. Number 10. If you know someone who's been catcalled and this causes them to be harassed, or if they've been assaulted, then support them in reporting it. Harassment and assault are illegal. They're crimes that can't be stopped if the police don't know about them. Don't just tell them to report it. Sit with them while they make the call. Go to someone you trust with them. Help them. The do nothing becomes the egg on. The egg on becomes the cat caller. The cat caller becomes the harasser. The harasser becomes the assaulter. The assaulter becomes the rapist. The rapist becomes the killer. Keep what we have said in your heart and in your head. This is happening to us and you can help. You can change. Think of how free we would be if people were decent to each other. Think what we all stand to lose if nothing is done.
Yeah. So, quite hard hitting, but that's from the voice of young people, and that's directly from then. Um, you know, I've been in this job 30 years, and um, still it's shocking. I've been guilty. My daughter come in home from school when she was little. So and so hit me at school today. Oh, he likes you. Because that's what was ingrained into us, isn't it? If you do want to watch that film again or show anyone that film, if you just go to Google and put in Be That Me, YouTube, it'll be there. It's the first thing that comes up. We've had some fantastic response to it. Some of the girls have been on BBC Sheffield Radio, Radio Hallam. We had one girl on Nugum, Nugum I can never, Monchetti, um, Radio 5 Live on their radio show. And yesterday uh, we were actually interviewed by ITV Calendar as well. So what I'm going to do in a minute, I'm going to give you set our details if you want to get in touch with us. Uh, but unfortunately then we've got to shoot off because we're going around the city picking consent forms up so that hopefully it will go out on calendar news tomorrow. If not, it might be Monday. So if you watch calendar, look out for it and you'll see some of the girls being interviewed. Um, and the girls who were interviewed yesterday are 15, 16 and 17. So have we got... Oh, we're back to the presentation. Um, just before we move on, I'm just gonna, all I'm going to flash up is my email address and the youth cabinet email address. So if you did want any more information about anything we've spoke about tonight, you can always email us. Um, if not, if there's anything anybody wants to know now, then have we got... That email address, just say it. Yeah, have we got a couple of minutes if there, anybody's got any questions? Well, any comments or questions from anyone? I think there's a question over here with Brian. Press it, press it off. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Really hard hitting, great stuff. Uh, it's coming from young people as well. That's important that they have a voice. Uh, and speaking of voices, I'm Deputy Chair of the Education, Children and Families Committee. Oh. Right? And I've been told to watch that, and I've finally got around to seeing it. Um, I think it would be great if you came and did a presentation to the committee. Most definitely. Yeah, yes. with, and the young people get involved in that as well. Absolutely. So that's what I wanted to say. Yes. If you can get in touch with the chair and say that the deputy chair said, you know, can you have a slot? Who do you like? If you let me know. It is uh, Dawn Dale. It's Dawn probably Dale. your best. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah Councillor Dawn. Yeah. Lynn, if you. Dawn, thank you. Okay, that's beautiful. If you take Brian's email, you can just forward the information and then move on from there. Perfect. There's another question on the middle table. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you, are talking about young people. Where is it that you engage them from? How do you pick the people to talk with? Okay. So they can... Oh, Emma. <laughs> She's got younger legs than me. Um, so they... Word of mouth, young people self-refer, we do um, put things on our website, it is getting a bit of an upgrade at the moment, so it's, it all needs changing around, but yeah, it's mainly word of mouth, we go into schools, we go into youth clubs, um, when the elections, every school in Sheffield does it, so um, we have over... 12, nearly 13,000 young people vote in the last elections um, so it, and it's every two years so in September um, we will be going into all the schools saying this is the opportunity and then the elections and results night is in February so it's quite a process so okay. thank you say hey, hello my name is Maher I am from uh, Tara, Cooks and Upper Walkley. Actually, it's not a question, rather than it's uh, like uh, some ideas or curiosity. I would like first to say thank you very much for this initiative. I mean, you are so much courageous to go into this area, which is very, very difficult to tackle teenagers. If you remember, we were all there one time, teenagers. Our ideas... We are flying, jumbled, confused. We don't know where are we going. So it's very important for a platform to gather these teenagers and educate them. And I'm sure you will have influence in reducing 
drug use, abuse drugs, and maybe other evils in the community. Theft like this. Because teenagers actually, they influence each other. One guy, if he's a bad guy, he will influence all 30, 40 students. But you can have this platform and correct behavior, maybe. I wish you can do that. If I missed the information, how long you have been working on this project, please? We started um, in March 21. 21. Could you please now, if you can, brief us about the results you have reached so far, or you don't have any studies? I mean, what is the outcome of this three years? And you started in 2021, 21, it was in COVID. So we started in COVID, the first meeting was in Western Park, all Saxon Regions Park, and that's where the first idea came from. And we were in Park for three years, and then we started in the out of that now is that some young people are talking about, yep, yeah, this has happened to me as a woman, but also as a gay young person or a trans young person, they're getting quite a bit of hate crime. So we're on to the next project. We're going to do something around hate crime next, um, and we've got a meeting in February. So it's continually um, building on what they're saying. And I think the beauty of why this is so powerful is because it is peer-to-peer. It's been picked up all over. There's been a massive impact. Some schools have shown it to every single pupil in their school. Other schools are a bit reluctant because they say they don't feel that it's appropriate because of the last slide of where the young people have tried to show the um, escalation, that's the word, Emma, um, as it goes through. We've got um, our licensing board have been training all our taxi drivers. They've all seen the film. So it's getting it out there as wide and far as possible. We were at our LAC meeting last night. We had Sheffield Wednesday reps. They're going to wait a way to talk to see if we can get it up on the screen at match days, for instance. Um, and everybody... I didn't ask them to write this down, but I, I suppose I, I can ask you guys the same. I do a little pledge. Even if it's, you go and tell one person about this film, to go and tell your family or show someone, like I say, Google it, then that is spreading the word, and that will help us get it out there and make that bigger, longer-lasting impact. Well, maybe the time here is not, maybe the, the time slot given to you is not enough. Maybe you, we would like to see, like, real, real example of how teenagers are influenced. Like he will tell us what he gets from the program or from the project. In reality, I mean, you could see them in, in the face. Anyway, uh, um, I don't know. I, um, sorry, I'm taking a lot of time. Yeah, I think we need to um, look behind Thank the you. schedule. If you have any questions to address to both of them, could you share your details with everybody? Okay. And like you said, um, I'll okay. extend the invitation to everybody in here to support them, which extends to everybody on this table as well, um, just because we're running short on time. But thank you so much. We'll have one last question, and then we're moving straight into item. Is it to relate with the two? Okay. The impact of that, and Malachi, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to... Malachi Go used to be a young advisor in our team five years ago, something like that. Yeah. Um, it's about giving confidence, making sure that they've got opportunities, raising those aspirations. So um, you want to see an outcome up for me, there's, there's one there. And uh, I can co-sign the work. taking all the credit because Saeed over there, we, we did a double whammy <laughs> from you, you to Jim. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate that. And it's true, the work they do is, was important to my life. So everything they've said to you today and the work they do with Saeed as well is genuinely, genuinely important in the city. Um, last question, if you can keep it direct so we can move on. Go ahead. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much. That's a good suggestion. Just so it's balanced out. Is that, does everybody agree with that? Would you rather no microphone and everybody shouts? Well, the thing is we want yes. a webcast. webcast yeah. There we go. This is new information to me. This records in the webcast for the public outside of here. So you just have to bear with us with these microphones. We will try and speak slow and coherently so you can understand us, okay? So I apologize, but we won't be able to do that for now. But we'll take that into account and probably fix the microphones in the future. But thank you for that suggestion. Um, moving straight to a deal now. He will be, he's the, well, he is the local area committee manager. He'll introduce himself and he will give a presentation and details on proposed spending. So, deal. Thank you, Chair. Can everybody hear me? I'm getting a thumbs up, so that's positive. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Adil. I'm the Central Lark Community Services Manager. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And thank you also to the team at the Burton Street Foundation for hosting us this evening. Um, it's great work that they deliver supporting diverse uh, communities and clients uh, across the city. Um, I wanted to provide you with an update. So in terms of my presentation, it's in two parts. The first part is around spend. Uh, members have packs and a report on their uh, tables. And the second element is around the projects that we've delivered out in the community and members have approved. Um, so in terms of this slide, um, the way that the LACs were set out, uh, we carried out consultation um, in August to October 2021. Um, out of the consultation, five key themes emerged, uh, which are on screen, so that's transport and highways, environment, communities and neighbourhood, uh, crime and community safety. Uh, in terms of the funds that were allocated to the local area committees, we have £100,000 to spend on community projects. Um, in terms of allocating the funds, we invited local community groups to submit bids to apply for the funds. Um, there are some uh, posters and flyers on desks and that were handed out to you upon arrival. Uh, Currently, we have received over 40 applications um, and 24 have been approved. Um, there is a leaflet that was handed uh, upon arrival. So over the next few slides, um, please, um, I'll share some of the projects that the councillors have approved. Um, under the environment theme, um, we've supported friends of groups. So we've supported the friends of Hillsborough Park, Wisewood Dis Wise District and Home Lane Garden. There's also been a new bin that has installed, um, is in the process of being installed on Leppings Lane uh, in Hillsborough. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, under communities and neighbourhood, there's been a wide range of projects that have been funded. Um, not all projects have been put on the slide. Uh, at the time of uh, collating this report, um, we've had some further spend uh, that has been approved. Um, so on here, there's some examples. So uh, the city ward members in Kellam Island have approved a community newsletter uh, and the Sunday Centre that provides food and shelter. Um, again, there's more information that we can share, but because time is of the essence, um, we've done a lot of um, approval of funding to support welcome places, places and the cost of living. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, again, there's some provision there. So we've supported Essex Food Bank, and that's across the central wards. Um, the Broom Hall councillors have supported the Broom Hall Centre uh, in regards to the cost of living. Um, under community safety and crime, um, the LAC members agreed to run a awareness campaign across the four wards to tackle violence against women and girls. Uh, we linked in to the colleagues from the Youth Services and South Yorkshire Police. Uh, there's some images to share later on in the presentation. Uh, and the Sheffield Street Pastors, uh, the, uh, the a group of volunteers that support uh, people during the nighttime economy uh, were also supported as part of the funds. If we can have the next slide, please. Um, in terms of a 
summary, uh, currently the spend is just over £20,000 um, and uh, I've got recommendations to the committee to note the current, the current spend and proposed spend um, and to also agree the grant of just over £9,000 to St Mary's Church and Community Centre uh, to tackle the cost of living and for them to provide a social supermarket and warm space. There's more details outlined in the report. Uh, the members of the committee have had uh, prior sight of that report before today's meeting. Uh, so we will ask for uh, member, uh, members to decide on that and also to note the outstanding balance of the LAC budget will continue to be allocated on projects subject to member decision in the community plan. I will pause now and ask the Chair for, um, to share that with the committee. Thank you Adil. So we'll go to firstly, um, does the committee accept the recommendations in the report and agree the grants of £9,225 and £92 to St. Mary's Church and Community Centre. Can I just have a show of hands just to be transparent? And I guess that is unanimous, so that has been approved. Brilliant. Great, thank you. Next slide, please. So the next section of my presentation uh, is in regard to the projects that we have been working on and delivering. Um, for those that don't know, that is Nessa, who is in my team, is my community services officer, so I'll plug Nessa there. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Um, so under the transport and highway theme, there's been a lot of projects that we've been working with members and partners and council services. Uh, we've worked alongside transport officers to make the Netherthorpe underpass in Walkley more accessible for wheelchair users and cyclists. Uh, vehicle activated signs are now installed in all wards across the LAX. These will be rotated every seven weeks and the data is being collected by uh, colleagues in transport. The ward councillors in the city ward and Walkley wards um, working alongside Crooks. Uh, we have uh, arranged public meetings on the active travel scheme uh, and the Shoreham Street Road clo closures. Uh, one of the key things that I'd like to point out, the, the fundamental reason for the lax is to ensure we share intelligence from local residents to inform the way that we deliver services, not just within the council, but also partners. Next slide, please. Under the environment theme, uh, the City Ward councillors approved community infrastructure levy funding to uh, the Kellam Island Community Alliance for the installation of planters. The introduction of plants on the bridge and on Green Lane will create new green spaces uh, and the main maintenance element of these, this project will be uh, conducted by the local volunteers in the area. The LAC have been working with St. Mary's Church on Bramall Lane to create a new litter picking group. Um, and in Hillsborough, the uh, local business forum, Hillsborough Together, was funded by the ward councillors to deliver um, an increase in street furniture so that local residents and the community will be more attracted to the Hillsborough shopping area to increase footfall. Next slide, please. Under the communities and neighbourhood themes, uh, we've held drop-in drop sessions for the tramline session to give uh, to provide a forum for local residents to f share feedback. Uh, this took place last year, and the events team within the council and tramlines organisers have been uh, shared. Uh, the, f the feedback has been shared to improve how this uh, moves on in the future. Um, we also worked with local youth groups to support their activities during the dark nights. So Unity Gym were funded by the Broom Hall councillors in terms of working in the local areas. Uh, the Broom Hall councillors uh, have also funded um, a, a group called the Independent Caribbean Collective to support the 60th Jamaican Independence Day and the Windrush celebration event. Uh, there was also a community celebration at St. Mary's to increase community cohesion um, and also find it to mark so South Asian Heritage Month. We worked with um, a group uh, 
a, a local group to provide them with a space outside Barker's Pool for a Threads of Unity event to, to embrace diversity within the city. Next slide, please. One of the themes that were in the community plan was around a week of action. So the LAC had a successful week of action in the city ward. We worked alongside South Yorkshire Police, AMI, NHS, various VCF, voluntary community and faith groups, uh, on street cleaning, drainage and overgrown hedges. Um, Andrew Mail and my team has been coordinating that um, and the community safety aspects of that was led by South Yorkshire Police, uh, uh, which were named Operation Steel, and we engaged with businesses um, and the street cohort in the city centre. Next slide, please. Under the Community Safety and Crime, uh, we have a monthly outreach session that is delivered with partners in the city centre, so we work with South Yorkshire Police, housing and colleagues from the church on Carver Street. It's to provide support to individuals who may have complex needs. Um, the Hillsborough and Walkley members join the police, South Yorkshire Police, on their operations to distribute over 600 information and contact leaflets to households. Uh, we have also worked with South, South Yorkshire Police uh, in Broom Hall to provide crime prevention advice. I touched a little bit earlier on regards to the White Ribbon campaign. So the LAC uh, members unanimously agreed to run a campaign during uh, the White Ribbon Day in November. Uh, and also this coincided with the World Cup, so the LAC officers went to businesses, bars, um, community groups across the central ward to raise awareness and promote uh, material. In the Walkley ward, uh, there was funding that was agreed through the Home Office and the Crime Commissioner's Office in regards to improving the Ponderosa Lighting Scheme. Uh, this was successfully delivered uh, for local residents who felt unsafe, but also to tackle and raise awareness of violence against women and girls. Um, next slide, please. And finally, under business employment and skills, one of the areas that we have been working on is to organise localised career fairs. Uh, that was uh, organised across five um, different local career fairs across the four lakh wards, uh, the most recent in the Broom Hall Centre. Um, we also uh, organised one at the St Mary's at Bramall Lane. Um, just in terms of some feedback from that, we had over 200 people attend uh, and over 70% have now gone on to permanent and full-time employment. So it shows that localised career fairs are actually working. Uh, we're hoping to continue that throughout this year. Um, and finally, the Hillsborough Ward Councillors approved some uh, community infrastructure levy funding for Hillsborough together to improve the street scene and furniture to increase footfall for the local area. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, if there's anything that you would like the LAC officers or the elected members to, to do or to come out to, to put on any events or hold a road show so we can capture your views. Um, our contact details are on screen. There's also officers and members um, here today, so please come and have a chat with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adil. That was amazing. I'm glad to know that 70% of people found employment, especially in this current um, economy. So. This is definitely working. And like you said, any future events or ideas you have, please note this down now. They're also dotted around here, and you can just suggest future events. I will be moving on to the draft local plan. So Laura Stephen, the planning officer, will give a presentation on the... Do you have a question? Yeah? Thank you. Um, yeah, so in terms of the, the career fairs, it, the Sheffield City Council organises the career fairs. There's independent providers uh, from across the city who then feed back in terms of intelligence. So they are independently reviewed and monitored. Um, it's not just one um, area or group 
um, that actually reviews that data. It comes from a wide um, range of people, and it is independently verified. So I, I work in that sector outside of being a counsellor and these provisions I've been supporting as well. And there's been large turnouts of young people, especially the Dark Nights Initiative, where they're coming around 5 to 6 in the evening to spend time, for example, whether it's in the gyms, whether to brainstorm, plan future CVs and jobs. So there has been a higher turnout, much higher turnout than previous years that I've seen. And that's from my experience working in that sector. So places like Unity Gym and the Brumwell Centre and things like that. Um, I do can speak on other organisations dotted around Central Lack, but from my eyes, it definitely has made a difference. And there's a lot more young people coming from the streets into these spaces during the dark nights. Is there evidence for that? Do you have that? I mean, yeah, there's, it's definitely documented. There's photographs, there's registers, there's parents um, giving consent forms. So all of this is monitored. So if okay, you do, if, thank if, you. Yeah, it's fine. So if you do want to assess it or come in and check those, you're more than welcome to come. You can take my details. Absolutely, that's the whole picture. And and the impact of it, um, you know, like you talked about the footfall in Hillsborough because of the street furniture. I want, just wanted to know if you actually evaluate the impact of that. That's a very good question. So I can't comment on Hillsborough. However, I can comment on where I am and they are, but I'll let Adil comment on the Hillsborough side. Yes, so, so in, in short, yes, we, we, we have a local business forum, but we also have business information officers that work with businesses in the area. Um, Andy and my team is the member for Hillsborough. In relation to Hillsborough, the... No, no, you can talk about long-term evaluation of projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's been done as part of the process. So different projects are evaluated in different ways. Some of them are based upon nationally evaluated schemes of work, and the light has proved to work. And if you look at the Susie Lamplew Trust, the Home Office, um, there's a lot of research about that. But in terms of the actual spend of the projects we've done, the evaluation would cost more than most of these projects, so we tend not to do it. Um, if it's a national project funded by the Home Office, they will often do evaluation as part of that, and you'll have an evaluation team put into that. Um, so some of the stuff the Police and Crime Commission does is evaluated. But again, that's a big amount of money to spend on what is fairly small project money. Does that kind of answer your question? Thank you for that. That was a very fair and necessary question, so thank you. I'm going to hand it over to Laura, and I'll let her show oh, you have one. Good evening, everybody. Um, Hopefully, I'll be able to speak slowly and clearly enough for you to hear me. And I'm hoping that there'll be some slides behind me in a moment. <laughs> um, right, thank you all for coming. And, and particularly, thank you to those of you who came to have a chat with us before the session this evening. It's, it's always quite good to get people's perspectives on things and, and hear what people in different parts of the city are interested in. Um, so I'm not going to keep you too long because we're going to have a breakout session after this where you've got a chance to speak to me and my other colleagues who are with us about various aspects of the plan. So I'm going to run through what the Sheffield plan is, sorry, the draft Sheffield plan, how it affects central Sheffield in particular, how you can comment and then what will happen to those comments and when we hope that the plan will be finalised. So the draft Sheffield plan, I'm not going to just read this out, but broadly speaking, it's the statutory local plan for our city, and, and every local authority um, is required to produce one. The main things that it does is set out the vision and guide future development in our city, and it also guides decisions that are made on planning applications. Once this, this particular plan is finalised, then planning application decisions will be made in accordance with this plan. 
covers all of the city, apart from the bit in the National Park, and we're looking for a period up to 2039. It will be reviewed during that time, but it's really important to consider that this is a long-term plan. Um, it's not sort of sh short-term, it is strategic, and it looks at a long time period so that we give greater certainty to what's expected to happen in the city during that time. It's going to um, take over from two existing parts of plan that we have, the Unitary Development Plan, which is from 1998, and the 2009 core strategy. Thank you. So a few things that it does, it allocates land for a range of different uses. That's effectively setting it aside for those uses, protecting it for them, particularly for things like housing and employment land. It also identifies those places that we protect from development happening, so in particular the green belt, open spaces, areas that are protected for wildlife, that sort of thing. Um, it, in particular, it gives us a really good opportunity to improve the requirements that we make upon planning applications coming forward, particularly around things that are um, considerations that are really important now but perhaps weren't around when the previous plan was developed. So, for example, we've, we've listed their um, space standards for new homes and uh, reductions in carbon dioxide emissions, also things like accessibility of homes, um, biodiversity net gain, it sets out our ambitions for transport and travel. In that, it reflects the transport plan for the city. Um, and it also will help us to secure contributions from developers in the city that can then be used for community benefits. In fact, the, the previous um, presentation uh, showed that some of the costs uh, for Hillsborough street, street Scene improvement came from the community infrastructure levy. And that's, that's sort of a knock-on effect of, of planning policies. Thank you. So the plan comes in five parts. Um, we've got some hard copies. Please don't take the hard copies away because they're very rare, um, but you're very welcome to flick through them whilst you're here. Um, there's five parts. Part one is the, the vision. So it's a high-level strategy for the city that sets out the spatial strategy as well as sub-area policies and um, site allocations. The second part is the bit that is sort of the nitty-gritty of when we're determining planning applications, the policies that we would apply. Then there's a schedule of those allocated sites, uh, parking guidelines, a policies map, a diagram. The policies map is actually really easy to view online. You can toggle different layers on and off, but we have got some sets of maps for you to look at, and there's also some being up on the back um, display boards. Um, also, just for anybody who does want to spend a bit more time with the paper copies of those documents, they are also available for reference in libraries and first points. Thank you. So how does the plan affect Sheffield Central? This is actually a little bit different to some of the other presentations that we've done. I've split it into two parts because obviously the city centre is quite a, a law unto itself in some ways. It's, it's quite a key part of the plan. So I've separated that out from Broomhill and Sharavale and Hillsborough and Walkley. I think perhaps law unto itself is the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, quickly looking at central Sheffield, um, what you can see there is an extract from the proposals maps that are, that are up on the back boards. Um, obviously, it's, so this is a slide that perhaps should have been in here, but the, the spatial strategy for this plan is really to ensure that we're meeting the needs of um, Sheffielders in terms of new homes and new jobs over the next 15 to 20 years by regenerating our existing urban area and building in the most sustainable locations that we, that we can do rather than expanding out into the green belt. So what that means is that there's quite a significant focus on new development in the city centre. So to sort of break that down a little bit into parts to make it easier to handle, we've got six character areas in the city centre. And as well as that, there are five priority locations where we've done a deeper level of master planning work along with some partners to look at what the capacity for new homes is in those areas, but also how we might diversify the housing stock in those areas, because one of the really important things about this plan is that we need to try and encourage a greater diversity of people to be able to make their home in the city centre safely and with uh, the spaces that they need to do that. So in the city centre, we've got 178 allocated sites. A lot of these have already got planning permission, um, but those are sites for employment, for housing, for open spaces, and as well as uh, some mixed-use sites. Uh, we think there's a capacity for uh, just over 18,000 new homes over the plan period that I talked about. And as well as that, we're setting aside just over 10 hectares of employment land in the city centre with a particular focus on city centre office zones. 
Um, as you'd expect, the city centre remains a priority location for retail and leisure activity. Um, we have identified a primary shopping area, um, and as well as being the, the main location for cultural and tourism development. Um, the plan will also support proposals coming forward around the Sheffield Midland, Midland Station and Sheaf Valley area through a development framework. Thank you. So this is a, a different insert of the plan. This is a, a key diagram um, for the city centre, and you can see sort of spots on that, which are the larger housing sites and employment sites. They are different colours, but you may not be able to see from a distance. Um, what that does is it identifies the strategic, that is larger, and non-strategic housing, employment, and mixed-use sites. And it also shows you the area which is designated for neighbourhood planning at, at Kellam Island and Neeps End. Um, you can also see, if you're closer to it, um, some new urban green spaces, uh, particularly around uh, Scotland Street and Rutland Road, um, as part of uh, more master-planned priority framework areas. And in the top right corner, uh, the northeast of the city centre, you can see the beginnings of the advanced, advanced manufacturing innovation district, which is the area running out along the Don Valley, where we're going to be focusing um, efforts on trying to deliver employment, particularly in uh, areas such as advanced health care and um, carbon-free technologies. That's probably the wrong term. Slide. Thank you. So just an example on this slide of one of the priority frameworks that I spoke about. This particular one is Furness Hill, which sits between Scotland Street and Shalesmoor. Not to get into the, the detail particularly of this map, but I suppose what I'm trying to show you is the level of detail that we've gone to looking um, in a very realistic way at what we think the capacity for new homes or, or mixed uses might be in those areas and where change is needed, for example, to make a better community by building in open space, ensuring that there's uh, sort of reflected character from existing heritage buildings in those areas, looking at the movement patterns, how people might um, move uh, by foot or cycle through those areas um, in, in quite a holistic way because we're aware that we can't just um, expect community to build from single, um, single developments brought forward. It does need a more holistic approach to bring forward new communities within the city centre if we're to deliver the number of new homes that we need to. So, moving outside of the city centre itself and into the, to the rest of this lack, um, broadly it's a picture of stability. What you can see on the slide here yes. oh, sorry. Um, is policy areas that broadly remain similar to how they are in the unit development plan, which is to say that a lot of the area is housing policy areas where we wouldn't expect to see an awful lot of change. Uh, there's, um, there are some strategic housing allocations, but largely they're ones that have already got planning permission. Um, through different policies within the part one of the, the plan, uh, the support for the district centres at Hillsborough and Broomhill and Ecclesaw Road, that's quite an important part of our aspiration to move towards what are called 20-minute neighbourhoods, where people would expect, as many people as possible, would expect to be living somewhere that they can easily access the sorts of services and facilities that you use on a daily basis, either by walking, cycling, scooting, whatever it might be, uh, or on a bus, but not necessarily in a car. Um, another quite important feature of uh, this sub-area is the strategic employment sites along the Upper Don Valley to continue to make sure we have enough land for employment. Um, Around the, the Broom Hill, Crooksmoor area, there's continued resistance to new HMOs in areas with high concentrations. That's, that's putting into the plan the existing Article 4 direction area, which wasn't in the previous version of the plan. Um, and it also reflects the capacity of uh, development sites within the Be Best neighbourhood plan area, which is broadly speaking limited to conversions or redevelopments exi of existing buildings um, in line with their neighbourhood plan. Um, there's also protection for urban green spaces. Okay, so we're, we're into week three of six of our public consultation period at the moment. And what we're actually doing is asking respondents to basically tell us whether the plan is sound. So this is quite a legalistic part of the plan making process, but broadly speaking, what we're asking is, does this plan meet, meet future development needs and it, does it protect the environment? Is it justified 
Is it deliverable and is it consistent with government's planning policies? After the public consultation period, which finishes on the 20th of February, we could pr propose amendments to the plan reflecting um, comments that we've received. What we would then do is submit those amendments alongside the plan as it's drafted currently to the government and they will then be considered by an independent planning inspector through a series of examination um, discussions. Thank you. So roughly speaking, here's our timetable until this plan is in place. Obviously, we're in the public consultation period at the moment. After we finish this, as I said, we'll have to collate the responses we receive and determine what, if any, amendments are required to, to be submitted alongside the plan. So we aim to submit, to submit the plan to the government during the summer. After that, an independent planning inspector will be appointed. And at that stage, the public examination is slightly out of our hands. The inspector will look at all the background documents and the plan, as well as comments received, and they will determine what the themes for discussion are throughout the examination. What we'd expect is that could take around a year to 15 months um, with, with a series of examination hearings. Uh, we then receive a preliminary report from the inspectorate and consult if there are any, major mod if there are any modifications to the plan. Um, after that, the council would then be able to move to adopting the plan, at which point the policies included within the plan would be able to start being utilised. Thank you very much. What we're going to do now is have a period of time where we can have... Oh, I'm not sure. We have 20 minutes? Uh, well, we had 45 minutes for the breakout. Mm. However, yeah, the time was running quite late. We have... I just want to highlight we have two public questions so if you want to ask a question but we haven't received it please ask your councillors on the table if they can't answer the question they'll get it back to you via email but we only have two for the end and then we need time for the feedback from them so okay. you, you so judge the time and give them 20, 20 yeah 20 25 minutes so we've got around 20 minutes 25 minutes we've got five five planning officers between us and we've got several sets of maps so what we'd like you to do is, if possible, to form into either two or three groups so that we can sit with you and you can ask us any questions that you might have, bearing in mind we don't have all of the answers, um, and we're happy to have a, an open conversation with you, or if anybody wants any information on how to make their comments to the consultation, then we can take those. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's six tables, so we'll do two councillors per table and one on that one just to be fair. And I urge the councillors to facilitate, so note taken, just make your job a little bit harder. <laughs> Can everybody go back to their seats, councillors? Could you come back to the front? We will be starting again in 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next slide. Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much, everybody. Um, can you just assign one person per table to feedback one key thing that you've discussed on your table? We can start with this table and quickly fly through this way, and then we can wrap up the meeting. So, one key thing that, that's been addressed? I guess we talked about um, community facilities. Um, and particularly community facilities like the one we're sitting in today. Um, I think we reflected on the fact that master planning was a good way to, to make sure that, I hope you agree with this, but it was, a, it was a good way to make sure that those community facilities are, are planned. But I think if we're, that's the positive side of it. I think the negative side of the conversation was that actually the types of community facilities like this, a plan, a strategic plan of this nature, can only go so far to, to deliver the types of facilities that everybody in the community finds to be useful. So it, 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 the, the constraint of the plan in terms of its sort of high-level strategic nature means that it, it can go so far, but actually it can't deliver everything for, for everybody that would live in, in, in a community. So that's, that's uh, the pros and cons of that conversation. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, Quick some really eminent speakers in this room uh, some really good people I'm alright we are mate uh, basically 20 minutes or whatever we had to discuss the future of our city I don't think is enough I think that it'd be good to harvest the potential in the room and wider to spend half a day or something like that helping the planners and giving ideas because then we're going to get a better city than when we've long gone the city is actually better because we've invested more time and trying to help you as councillors to get it right more. I, that's what I think, anyway. Thank you. What's your name, sorry? My name? Yeah. Mark. Mark. Thank you, Mark, and I do agree with that. Is that something that we can do with you? Yeah, definitely. So, afterwards, if you just drop your email, we can get that organised. If anybody wants to be part of that as well, we'll create them sessions. Like you said, half a day. The words you used, harvest the public. As long as it takes for the benefit of the city, isn't it? Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Brian's table, you said... Engagement was one of the things that was really key on this table here. Uh, we had lots of concerns over the consultation itself. Who is it reaching and who is it going to involve? Uh, and then at the final thing, will the government pay attention, was one of the things that came out of this group. Um, so we then moved on to talk about you know, the, the main thing on the, on the plan, which is on housing, uh, and that it was family and rental, and is it in the right areas? Will it be affordable? Was it, was it a key concern on this table? Um, and the percentage of housing that will be disability accessible. Uh, we, had, we had quite a, a, a discussion, heated maybe, I don't know, about 20-minute neighbourhoods and uh, for concerns that they might be forced on people. And, and I would, for my part, I was keen to say, no, they won't be forced on people. It's about a choice. At least it is as far as I'm concerned. And then we also talked about guidance on navigating the local plan that that needs to be better, but it's an enormous plan, so how do you do that? And we came up with a, with a, a bit of a conclusion about we need more outreach to, to uh, local neighbourhood groups. So actually, there was some discussion about the, the plan, Sheffield plan, but actually a lot of it was about consultation and, and improving it, which is going to be tricky in the next three weeks. Any, anyone else on the table? I, um, think thank I you, anything Brian. Else? We're going to do one highlight per table. We okay. have literally two minutes left, so thank you. Michael, just wants to respond. Michael will respond to it, and then we'll swiftly move along with one highlighted issue per table. Thank you. Uh, just quickly, in terms of public engagement, it's just, it, I guess it's just to, to say, so we're, we're coming to each lack, um, but we're conscious that, 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 that we're not reaching as wide a demographic as we like to in that scenario, so... There's drop-in sessions across the city. There's three in the city centre where we're spending days in the mall markets and in the winter gardens. And we're, within the city, we are, there's, there's 
more development. We're, we're doing drop-in sessions there as well. We're doing drop-in sessions online, and we're doing specific sessions online as well where we're reaching out to different types of groups. The, the sessions next week with the Sheffield the Property Association, so the business community, with the climate and biodiversity groups, but we have also identified and, and targeted um, different groups, community groups within, within the city and, and groups that represent harder to reach people within the city or, or, or vulnerable people and from an equalities point of view. We've had quite a lot of feedback in that respect and we've listened to how they want to communicate with us and some people are happy just to comment on the plan. Some people want dedicated sessions which we are facilitating for those groups as well. So I think just for... For balance, it's just worth saying that there's a huge amount that actually the team behind you, which is a really small team, are putting in to make sure that we are reaching as much of Sheffield's community as we can. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And can we just thank the planning team for taking their time out to speak to everybody today? Unfortunately, we've run out of time to go across all tables, but if you keep it in written form and hand it over, we'll take that into account in our next members' meeting. Um, I'd like to go straight to the public questions and petitions now because I'm quite conscious of time. We've only received one in advance, so we can only allow that one to go ahead. However, every single person who's written on the screen sheet has written their email, and I can ensure every single person will have a response for their question. So the question from, is from Debbie Love. Debbie, are you here? Debbie. Um. Right, it's about the traffic violation on Dodd Street and they bring public safety. Myself and my neighbours first contacted Bernard Little in November 2021 with concerns about the number of vehicles driving the wrong way on Dodd Street. Uh, from May 2021 to December 2021, 176 vehicles were recorded <coughs> on my ring doorbell located on my front door. Uh, driving the wrong way up the one-way street. A substantial number of these vehicles are commercial, including taxis and delivery vans. Uh, initial meeting and discussion in November 2021 with Bernard Little resulted in painting a no-entry sign on Ripley Street and a sign highlighting of the overgrown edge on the corner of Dodd Street and Ripley Street. Other potential ways of addressing this issue were discussed with Bernard Little, but no action has been taken. To, to clear this issue is an ongoing and a concern 24-7. Thank you very, very much for that question. Uh, does anybody in the council tables would like to respond to that? Ruth? Something that might be of interest, and that's that last week the Transport Committee passed a motion to ask the Department of Transport. Sorry, can you hear me now? Um, can I? Yeah. About. Um, about Dodd Street, which is on the cusp between Walkley and Hillsborough. And there's a big problem there in that a street that is a one, designated as a one-way street, the traffic, there's many, many times traffic is actually going the other way. And, in, you know, they're driving dangerously. And I was, Debbie came to me last, well, 15 min months ago, we tried to sol solve the issue by paint, and we, the council painted a big sign on the on the uh, entry to the street on Rip junction with Ripley Street, and it, that said no entry. But actually, it's not made any difference whatsoever. What's happening is that traffic is actually, you know, driving recklessly into that air, into that area, causing problems. So. This is something that I, I, we, I brought this to the, the, uh, the, the LAC uh, 15 months ago to, to how we can we address this. At the time, we didn't have the resources, but there's so much pressure on the council team itself to 
pushed through various schemes that we've put it on a, you know, it, it's actually not got to the top of the list. So that's where we are. So the response we've had from Debbie's question is uh, work with the camp. We've worked with, we intend to work with the council's transport and highways team to seek advice on what can be done to stop traffic entering Dodd Street the wrong way. Secondly, we're working on engagement. The work again will involve working with the council's transport and highways team. Thirdly, we're going to involve partners such as South Yorkshire Police who are already involved and we're working to establish some support following a request from myself as a councillor and colleagues who attend the Walkley Neighbourhood Action Group. Fourthly, we will work to prioritise this request and request our transport and highways colleagues, colleagues to investigate and pro provide us with, with solutions. And I'll be working with my fellow councillors in Walkley on this. Fifthly, we will keep you and local residents informed on updates and progress and request input when requested and required. Finally, we would like to encourage you, Debbie, to, to contact the three local ward councillors or the central LAT team who are here today uh, and should you have any further queries during the process, we will, we will investigate the query. So that's where we are at the moment. So I apologise for how long it takes, but this is what being a councillor is about very often. It's very frustrating but we've got a good team here and we've got a good team in Walkley, of councillors in Walkley, who are pushing this thing now forward. So that's where we are. But please, please keep contacting myself and Tom and, uh, and Ben uh, to say what's going on. If, if it, things progress, continue this way, I will contact, we will contact the local police who will step up uh, patrols. But it, they do seem to drop off after a while, assuming perhaps that things have changed. But it is a very dangerous junction, and there's a school at that junction, and there are older people on that road who aren't able to park their car near their house, and some people have actually have to park their car well outside the neighbourhood. So this situation is horrendous, as it is horrendous in many places across, across the, the ward and across the city. But that's where we are, and we're, we are aware it's a huge issue. And when we're looking at things like planning, as we've been doing today, we need to consider where we're going to put developments that are going to create more traffic. And we've got to commit, take these sorts of issues into consideration when we're making these bigger plans. So I hope that goes some way to, uh, to answering your question, but please, please keep up the conversation with us. Thank you thank very you. much, Bernard, for that answer, and thank you, Debbie, for the question. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so we'll do the minutes of the previous meeting, and then if you have any feedback with how any of this was run, as I addressed in the beginning, I will personally stay behind if you've got time. Come speak to me. I'll note down what you've one for the next LAC meeting, and then we'll try and address that in the future. So for now, can the members of the committee approve, as an accurate record, the minutes of the previous meeting held on 19th of October 2022? Can I just see a show of hands? Approved. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, on the council website, yeah. Thank you. So that's the meeting done. As I said, I'll still be here. I'll go over there because I know some people will be waiting afterwards. Come speak to me and if you have any feedback how this is run, what you want changing and how you want it to improve, I'll be on that table. Thank you very much. Thank you. And can I lastly just thank, thank the Taras for coming today. We appreciate your presence. We know you've travelled far, so I'm very, very grateful. If anybody has any question how they can support the Taras, please go over to that table over there where they're sat and they should provide you with more information. So thank you again for coming.